I am Alec Haller. I am now the Emeritus Professor of Pediatric Surgery at Johns Hopkins. I am a graduate of the, of the Hopkins Medical School in 1951, uh, and uh, I had my surgical training here at Hopkins under Dr. Alfred Blaylock. I was a fellow at Helen Tausig's uh, congenital heart disease clinic. I was a fellow at the clinic from 50, 51 to 52, and then 52, 53, I was a resident in pediatrics. My name is uh, David Valley, and I'm a professor in uh, the McCusick Nathan's Institute of Genetic Medicine and the Department of Pediatrics. And I did my house, house staff training at Hopkins, so I came here as an intern in 1969. That was after Dr. Tausig had retired, but she was still around. Uh, and you would see her walking in the halls occasionally. And also, uh, her, her trainee, Catherine Neal, was one of the senior leading pediatric cardiologists here. So I saw uh, a good bit of, doc of Dr. Neal uh, and occasionally Dr. Tausig. So I chose as my first clinical rotation pediatrics because of my interest in, ch in children. At that time I didn't know that it was going to be children's surgery. Uh, and I first met Dr. Tausig then on my rotation in pediatrics when I elected to take her course in pediatric cardiology. I remember very well in the old Harriet Lane outpatient clinic uh, where she introduced herself uh, and uh, at that time she carried a black box with her that was about uh, two feet wide and two feet long. Uh, and it turned out to be a special instrument that she had had manufactured to augment her lack of hearing. And so in order to be able to hear heart sounds and listen to the chest, she had to uh, augment uh, the sounds. And so this was hooked up to her uh, stethoscope. And uh, so there she was in front of the group uh, introducing herself. And then she had her black box turned on. And then she said, uh, I want you to have a chance to see some of the um, pediatric cardiac patients that we have in the outpatient clinic. Uh, and when they were presented to us, they were all cyanotic. They were all blue. And I thought that was really strange. And then she said, the reason I'm showing you these is this is my commitment. I want to find out why these children are blue why, what should be done to help them because they have so much cyanosis and hypoxemia that they have spells uh, and those cyanotic spells may end in death and all of these children are dead before they're teenagers. Dr. Towsing was a very quiet person. I think she was an introvert because, partly because, uh, she was so deaf and that made communication difficult for her. But also in personality, she was just a quiet person, very thoughtful, very considerate of everybody at every level, uh, and also of her patients who all adored her. And so many of them continued to stay in touch with her long after they had been treated either medically or surgically or both. Um, she was also very committed to the care of her children. Uh, she was very protective of her children. She wanted to be sure they were well taken care of. Uh, she uh, was not uh, um, aggressive about this, but she was very determined. And uh, as a matter of fact, for the first uh, uh, blaylock Tausig operations, she was actually in the operating room uh, I always felt that she was there to protect her child from the surgeons. Uh, in any event, uh, she was comfortable doing that, and uh, that was one of the difficulties in her relationship with Dr. Blaylock, because of course he, as a surgeon, saw what the mechanical problem was, saw what needed to be done. 
he knew the parents and always related to them in a, a warm way, but he didn't hover, and she was a hoverer. Uh, and seemed to be always there, you know, questioning why this was being done, why that, although it was frustrating to Dr. Blaylock on a number of occasions, and he indicated that uh, he tolerated it because she was so good and because she was uh, so detailed in her evaluation of the patients that she was rarely wrong, even though we didn't have some of the, so the sophisticated types of studies that we have now. Uh, she was a very uh, happy lady, but quite authoritative, and uh, it took a while to really get to like her, but uh, eventually she became very respected and very liked. Uh, they were always very pleasant. She had a way with little children and was very considerate of the parents. She was a good example of the other faculty. Well, I think she had to concentrate tremendously on uh, what she heard because of her hearing defect. And that produced a, uh, an attitude which was very, very specific about what was going on, why. I think she was pretty, um, in the window in which I saw her, I think she was pretty a professional is the way I would describe it. She was not uh, particularly warm and fuzzy, uh, but she was, um, you know, very straightforward, seemed very straightforward and uh, very knowledgeable and um, interested in patients and pediatric uh, heart disease. Yes, one of the things I think that needs to be mentioned in this relationship between Dr. Taussig and Dr. Blaylock is that there has been discussion over the years about why it's named uh, the operative procedure, the subclavian, the pulmonary artery operation is named the Blaylock Taussig. Why isn't it called the Taussig Blaylock? Or even why isn't uh, uh, there some mention of the technician uh, in the name? Uh, I think to set the record straight factually, the idea for the surgery came from Dr. Taussig. She had noticed in some of her blue babies, Ben, that uh, some of them seemed to do better than others. They, some, most of them got bluer and bluer, increased cyanosis, and then died. But a, a small percentage of them uh, lived through their teenage into, into young adulthood. And she noticed in, in following them that a number of them had a continuous heart murmur over the chest, which was due to a patent ductus arteriosus that that had not closed. And so she reasoned that this might be a way in which blood was getting into the lungs to augment the uh, pulmonary stenosis and lack of blood flow. So she then, on that basis, said, I'd like to see if it's possible to make a, an artificial ductus arteriosus. She even went so far as to go up and talk uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Robert Gross at the Boston Children's Hospital who in 1939 de divided the, the first patent ductus arteriosus, very proud of his accomplishment, and it was the opening of congenital heart surgery. Uh, when she approached him, uh, she congratulated him on his uh, what it accomplished, and then she said, but I'm interested in making a ductus arteriosus. Do you think you, you could do that? And he is said to have pulled himself up uh, properly in front of her and said, Madam, I ligate ductuses, I don't make them. And thus missed the whole opportunity of uh, developing the procedure that ultimately resulted uh, in the Blaylock's housing shunt. So I think she should be given primary credit for the idea. She, of course, did not have any technical ability to carry it out. I had no idea how it could be done. Uh, it, that was left for Dr. Blaylock and Vivian Thomas. Uh, 
I came in 1950, okay. which was uh, six years after the original operation, which was in 1944. And I think uh, while I was there, there was a, the, the 1,000 blue baby that was operated on. <laughs> quite a lot of experience ahead of me. Oh, I, I mean, I think it was there all the time. I, uh, in 1954, uh, I was invited to uh, take over the heart clinic in Martinsburg, West Virginia, which he had started in 1950. Uh, they asked me if I'd like to do the job. So I uh, ran that clinic from 1954 to 1992 when I retired. Very often we have discussions about the patients that I referred to the clinic and uh, requested uh, services and surgery. And I was involved with the care of some of those patients. One of the things Dr. Park did was to decide that uh, in order to develop as a, a, a component of medicine that pediatrics needed to, de to specialize in certain areas. And so he, uh, based on that sort of game plan, he picked Dr. Kausig to do cardiology and he picked Dr. Livingston to do epilepsy and he picked Lawson Wilkins to do uh, endocrinology. And so he made a number of choices and in almost every one of those instances, um, his choices were, uh, the people he picked became leaders in their respective sp subspecialties in pediatrics. Um, but I think uh, none more in a more outstanding way than Dr. Tausig and perhaps given that she was a woman and cardiology was really just developing, uh, particularly anatomical cardiology as opposed to you know, coronary, coronary artery disease and that sort of thing. So I think um, Dr. Tausig and, you know, doing her um, uh, fluoroscopic examinations underneath the stairs in, uh, in Harriet Lane and stuff like that, uh, you know, she, she clearly is a person who just wouldn't take no for an answer. I mean, she saw what was the right thing, the right way for things to work and, and she did it. And she did, she left a legacy. When I was a house officer, uh, Yusuf Karsh came to uh, take the famous portrait of Helen holding the baby and, and listening to the baby and so on. And so I was, this, I think I was either an assistant resident or senior resident. I guess maybe I was, um, I can't, I, I, I probably was an assistant resident that year. And um, so I heard somehow through the grapevine that Karsh was going to be here to take a picture of Helen Tausig. And I knew who Karsh was because I was interested in photography. So I was eager to, uh, you know, see Karsh in action, basically. And uh, I heard that um, the plan was to um, take a picture of Dr. Tausig listening to a, an infant. So I said, well, um, we have to find a baby who's had a left lateral thoracotomy because that would be the approach for uh, blood like Tausig. And so quickly searched around my network of fellow house officers and found that infant. And um, this is pre-HIPAA days, and I don't know if students can appreciate that, but uh, you know, we just went and got that baby and brought the baby down. I, I don't recall the baby's name or anything. I presume it was on CMSC5, which was the infant floor. And uh, that's where that baby came from. Um, and the person who wrote the article in the Times uh, also commented on the Karsh photo and said, well, obviously the Karsh photo was staged. Well, of course, any Karsh photo is staged. I mean, they're not candid snapshots, so that was a little obvious. But then the guy, uh, the writer, whoever it was, wanted to uh, fortify his argument and said that everybody knew that um, Helen was hard of hearing, and in the picture she has a stethoscope. So his point was, it was all fake, but in fact, she did use her stethoscope. It, that was not hers because hers was had a much thicker um, sort 
sort of head on it. That, I guess that's where the electronics were that did the augmentation of the sound. And I've had friends who listened in that stethoscope, and they said you could hear, you could hear the elevators going up and down, down the hospital with that thing, because it was really turned up a lot so that she could hear. I don't want to speak <clears throat> for somebody, particularly somebody who's no longer with us, but knowing her pretty well, I think she would reiterate what I said, uh, but also I think she would say, uh, have some particular idea that you want to explore. Find the person who's working in that area, go and ask if you can be a junior associate. First of all, you won't be turned down. And second, it gives you a window of opportunity to take advantage of what's already known in the field without having to fight your way through Google or all, uh, textbooks or all other kinds of reading material. There's a living person there at Hopkins who's probably the world's expert in that and you didn't even know it. And uh, as she pointed out, I didn't know that I had the world's best cardiac surgeon uh, as my colleague until I worked with Dr. Blaylock and uh, it would never have occurred to me to do anything about asking about it had I not known about his interest from Vanderbilt and the fact that he was a Hopkins graduate himself. I think it's um, the practice of medicine and the uh, exposure it brings you to human biology and the research going on across all levels of this and the advances being made in uh, preventing disease and treating disease are really making an exciting time. Uh, from my own point of view I see a lot more sort of rules and regulations and things that might make it less fun but I, I hope that people still find it fun and uh, both stimulating and rewarding, uh, stimulating and rewarding but also fun. And um, I think that um, one of the things that has made it so much fun for me is uh, interacting with my colleagues. And I think probably as students you will be making friendships that will last uh, through the rest of your career. And um, you'll learn, the people you learn the most from are your fellow students because they're the ones you spend the most time with. The faculty will come in and out, you know, do their thing for a little while and then fade out again. But um, You'll um, so take advantage of the fact that uh, the, you have such good uh, student colleagues and what you can learn from them and, and so forth. Um, it's a, a great privilege and a responsibility to be in medicine and um, lots of really exciting stuff to do. Uh, so um, I think uh, uh, you want to do a good job, uh, but you should enjoy it along the way. I presume, um, just based on what I know of her life, that she would tell them to pick something that they um, really found important and, and make it happen, basically. And, uh, and don't be deterred by sort of uh, minor obstacles that got in the way. Um, so I think that's the way she lived her life. She was uh, committed to her patients and committed to uh, a level of, a very high level of excellence.